We have Catherine Boyle, general partner at Anderson Horowitz. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Eric DeMarco, President and CEO of Kratos Defense, Dr. Jason Rathje, Director of the Office of, the, of Strategic Capital at the Pentagon, and Trace Stevens, Co-Founder and Executive Chairman of Andrel Industries. Uh, the signal to suppliers uh, earned a, a tough grade uh, in the NSIB report card. We're looking at a D here. Um, communication was considered to be a bright spot, but budgets in particular uh, were considered a, uh, a stumbling block as the Pentagon tries to uh, develop this and develop the innovation base and to actually transition to programs of record. Uh, I'm interested to hear from industry, from funders, and, and also from you, Jason, how, uh, how you think that, that grade uh, was earned, whether it's fair, <laughs> and, uh, and how you can move forward. Do you want me Jason, to start? Go ahead. Okay, yeah, sure, great. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, certainly, you know, Office of Strategic Capital, we've been around for about 15 months now, and we just recently released our investment strategy um, that is a way that we are trying to communicate better directly with suppliers. And one of the areas that OSC is, is very focused on is catalyzing the um, component supply base. So we're looking at areas of our of our industrial base broadly that support both our national security and our Department of Defense and our broader economic security. So what do I mean by that? One of our priority areas uh, is focused on materials for microelectronics. Right? Now, when we say you're transitioning capabilities to the warfighter, and you hear a lot about this when it comes to the national security innovation base, we've got to be better buyers and procurers, and certainly there's been a lot of, I think, progress towards those ends, certainly as I've seen it happen over the last five years. But where OSC is uniquely focused is nobody says, I'm going to transition our semiconductors to the hands of our warfighters, right? But everything our warfighters need relies on access to core component technologies. And the solid rocket motors is another area, right, that again is a core component technology, not something we buy directly, but in the systems that we procure. And a lot of OSC's focus in the supply base is specifically targeting those areas. And the tools that we're bringing to bear to help catalyze technological growth in our supplier base are tools that directly impact production and manufacturing. So we're bringing brand new tools out. Um, uh, recently we were authorized in, uh, uh, about three months ago to be able to provide direct loans to uh, critical technology companies, so companies that are aligned to our, our uh, supplier base needs. And so that means, hey, we're going to be able to provide project finance, equipment finance, you know, uh, new tools to be able to catalyze things like production capacity that support, again, both our defense industrial base and our broader industrial base, but allow us to make sure that we have access to what we need when we need it. Are you able to give us a, any uh, preview of the timelines for those, those first investments uh, or any of the companies that, that may have been selected? Well, you know, this is, uh, I think we're going to be moving a breakneck pace. I think the last federal credit program, which is the kind of group of programs that we're in, this is the first loan program in the Department of Defense. Um, there, almost every other government department and agency does this. There's 131 other federal credit programs. This is the first Title X loan program. I think the last loan program office took three years to get stood up. I, I, we're committing to move faster than that. Uh, but we have this great partnership with the Small Business Administration now where we could provide direct uh, um, loan guarantees to private investors to catalyze investment in areas that we think are important to national security. Again, aligned to the investment priorities we just published in the investment strategy. And we anticipate the first funds to be licensed through that process in the next few months, which is, is great. You know, we have funds focused on advanced manufacturing in our, in our lower to middle market tier two supplier base. Uh, when we talk about innovation, sometimes we talk a lot about, you know, venture-backed companies. A lot of the companies that we actually rely on are not venture-backed. Um, they do require capital to scale production. And so we're looking at tools that help catalyze that part of our supplier base. And then we're also with some of these new tools that we've worked closely with the SBA and the uh, uh, um, uh, an OMB on over the last few years allow us to work directly with venture capital as well and provide additional capital directly to um, – venture capitalists to help invest in areas that are normally non-investable. And what I mean by that is areas that are uh, generating lower returns uh, than your typical venture-backed companies are going to see. So areas that are in our, in our investment strategy 
you know, RF, RF uh, transmitting semiconductor chips, for example. Um, we're looking at advanced materials, uh, metamaterials, and nanomaterials. Biotech is a huge, huge area of focus for us, but also biotech manufacturing. And areas that we can catalyze more investment in those areas allows us to make sure that we're ahead of the game. So in you know, 30 to 40 years from now, we don't need another Chips and Science Act to kind of reshore an area that we had IP advantage in, but we can make sure that we can expand production and manufacturing for these new and emerging critical technology areas to make sure we have access to the technologies uh, and the products and services that are derived from those technologies within the United States. Thanks. So, I mean, moving back to the, the customer clarity grade, um, I'm interested to hear, Eric, perhaps from you, um, you know, the Reagan Institute deemed communication to be fairly strong um, from the defense uh, department to, to industry, but um, budgets received a grade I didn't even know was possible, an F minus. Um, you know, the, the lack of certainty, the lack of stability. Um, where, where do things fall from your perspective? What is, what is Kratos seeing in communication and the signaling that you're getting from the customer? I'll analogize it to a football. For the first 80 yards, the last 10 or 15 years, the clarity from the Pentagon has been 2020. Whether it be the strategy documents they put out, the national security documents, the war games we're invited to, the fight up the J books, you look at jet drones, hypersonic uh, solid rocket motors, propulsion systems for loitering munitions, software to find ground stations for software to find satellites. I can go on. The Pentagon has laid it out. So first 80 yards, 2020. Last, the red zone, I can understand some of the grades that were given. And is it, where, where are the areas of communication or, or lack of clarity uh, in, that, in that red zone? Um, from my perspective, the, the companies that, that, that uh, lean forward actually bring a product forward. It might not be 100% of the requirement, but it will be 90, 95% of the requirement. <laughs> they get to that red zone, and then the, the, the traditional process takes over as far as a solicitation. And in our, I'm not being critical. This is, this, is, this is the game we play. And so you can show up with the right product at the right time at the right price, but then the process takes forward, like some of the other panelists this morning have said, and, and one of them said, you, you know, you can have a teletransporter. I like to use a force field. We can come up with a force field. Trail come up with a force field to protect Washington from anything <coughs> coming in. He will. He'll come up with it. Ask him to do it. He'll do it. All right? But then it won't be bought for a number of years because the, cult, the traditional process takes over. And so that, that's how why I bifurcate it. First 80 yards, it's outstanding. Spot on. Last 20 yards, we all, need, we all need to work together. Trey, do you want to weigh in on the, the force field? And <laughs> what, what are the barriers to, to creating and then selling and scaling? No, I mean, Eric is right. The, it, the government is not the field of dreams. Like, you don't build it, and then the government's like, hey, you build it. Here we are. We're buyers. <laughs> um, if that was the way it worked, then we'd have all sorts of things that we don't have today. Um, and... You know, I, I had dinner with someone last night that um, said, man, Trey, I, I like the things that you have to say, but I would really like for you to be more optimistic and positive. So <laughs> I'm going to try a new me um, for a moment. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the signals in that first 80 yards, to borrow Eric's analogy, are, are, are absolutely right. I mean, we, we're doing all of the things to lay out, you know, we're investing in the innovation base, we're putting together DIU, we're increasing SBIR spending, we're communicating more openly about programs where companies are going to have a real shot on goal, whether that's replicator or whatever. And we could, we could spend the rest of this panel just talking about all of the things that we're doing right on the signaling side of things. Um, but you know, actually transitioning that into real production uh, is virtually impossible. Um, it's only been done a couple of times. If you look at like revenue uh, in the last five years, which is I think in the report card, I didn't flip into the appendix, but revenue over the last five years for venture-backed companies doing business with the uh, Department of Defense, it's a power law distribution. 
just like any venture curve where you have SpaceX has the most, Palantir has the next most, Andrew has the next most, and then there's like a, like a long tail that drifts off beneath that. And if we're going to take multiple shots on goal, we need to change that, that curve um, so that there's actually a possibility for companies to come in that offer real products that can be used by the warfighters in, in the real world. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges for funders in terms of uh, incentivizing investment given the, the, the problems uh, with the transition that we're talking about? Yeah, here? well, I'll, I'll say, like, the last time that I said, I, I, I'm trying to be optimistic as well, but the last time <laughs> that I, I spoke it was, or, or tweeted at RNDF, time was running out with Silicon Valley, that was 2021, and I made a prediction that was wildly wrong. I said it would be about 24 months before companies started dying, uh, before we had sort of, a, I would say, a retreat of venture capital from defense. Um, and what has happened is the exact opposite, which I think is a wonderful thing for this country. It's a wonderful thing for the, uh, what, you know, the people in this room, our companies, where investors are still taking bets on this category despite the F minus scorecard. And I think part of that is there is, uh, you know, people are looking at that 80 yards and they're saying, okay, there is things that have, that have changed. Uh, we speak the same language now. I'd say five years ago, you know, if, if someone came to Silicon Valley from the DOD, they, there, there would be, it was almost anathema. Like there was, there was no way that people could speak to each other, could have a conversation. Uh, the investors in the room didn't know the difference between an SBIR and OTA. Like there, there was sort of a, I don't, I don't understand it, therefore I want to invest. You now have a very, very educated investor base. You have educated founders. The vast majority of founders who are building new companies in the space have worked at places like Anduril or Palantir. Um, or SpaceX, like they understand the difficulty of working with the DOD. So there's a lot of wins that are coming out of this, this last generation of, of technology, and I think it, it kind of sets the board, to, to, to use the analogy again, like we are at the, the 10 yard line or the five yard line, like it, all we have to do is close the deals. And I do think that you're going to see, you know, you see patient capital, you see founders who are willing to, to say, okay, it might take a little bit longer than expected. But there will be a reckoning if we do not have more, more production contracts, if we do not see startups winning programs of record, because you can only require uh, Silicon Valley to be as patient as it can be for, for a little bit of time before people start saying, okay, it's impossible to work with the DOD. So I do think there has been, you know, uh, to, to give the optimistic cases traded, like there has been extraordinary change in the way we communicate, extraordinary uh, um, education on both sides, uh, within the DOD of how venture works, um, you know, within venture capital of how the DOD works and the expectations there. But we have to see some more wins in the next few years, or I do think we are going to see capital dry up. What message did, did founders, did funders receive from the abrupt closure of Shift, which had been a, a key nexus, I think, between DOD and Silicon Valley? I, I think it's, uh, it's one of these kind of disappointing, unforced errors, to be frank. Um, what a beloved program um, by both sides. Um, you know, I, I, Trey can speak to this as well. We've had you know, Shift Fellows inside of our, our companies. Shift Fellows work inside of our, our venture firm to teach them how venture capital works. Over the years, at, at multiple venture firms, I've, I've hosted Shift Fellows so they could understand, you know, how do, we, how do we even, even outside of DOD companies, how do we look at businesses in America? It was an exceptional program. It is an exceptional community. Um, and I think that community will live on despite uh, the unforced error of, of it no longer um, existing in its current form. But I, I think Trey could speak to it as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was a, a very useful program for the ecosystem, no doubt. And, you know, as all things, uh, these are people decisions. Like, it's human beings making decisions at the end of the day. And I can only imagine that there is some person or some set of people running around in the Air Force saying, we have to kill this program because there was some personal vendetta or something that they have for it. I want to know who that person is. So if any of you can tell me who the person is that was pushing for that decision, I would, I would love to talk to them. Just talk. <laughs> so Trey, I'll, I'll stay with you. How do we move forward? How, do, how does uh, the DOD founder-funder partnership traverse that, not just that last 20 yards, but the valley of death? You know, how, how do we move forward and, and nudge that grade upward? Uh, it, it comes down to decision making. Um, I think, you know, we could certainly offer hundreds, if not thousands, of policy suggestions, authorities that need to be changed, ways that oversight can play into the process in more effective ways. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's primarily just decision making. If you assume you have all the policies you need to make the right decisions, can we make the right decisions or not? And I think a lot of times we end up getting into this past performance mindset where, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like Adam Silver 
the commissioner of the NBA, like standing on stage with the 2024 Chicago Bulls, who are terrible for all intents and purposes, and handing them the trophy and saying, we're giving you this trophy because Michael Jordan was great in the 80s. That's what we're doing over and over again. We're giving the trophy to the 2024 Bulls for the accomplishments of Michael Jordan. And um, I think we have to get out of this mindset that the past their primes, not the primes, the past their primes are our only option. Because there are other options. We should be giving the trophy to the 2024 Denver Nuggets, not the 1983 Bulls. Okay. So um, I'd like to, to hear from, from Eric, actually. Um, we, the, the report card pointed to the, the congressional uh, budget process um, as, a, as a key stumbling block uh, in transition. How does that affect your company's efforts to innovate, to move forward, to transition? And I'll turn to each of you in turn. But. In my opinion, companies like us know what's happening in Congress. Is, this is normal. And we plan for it. And we don't anticipate a budget will be done on October 1st. We, we this year put a plan together that we're going to have a six-month CRA. We'll see what happens if we get one. So that's the planning part. The preparation part is we have done everything we can for the last seven or eight years, and I know other companies have done the same and they're doing it. The, most of our products and technology is dual use. I think 30, 35 percent of what we do is commercial or international. So it's not tied to the budget. So we have a hedge, right? And so we, we try to strategically plan for it and tactically uh, have dual use technologies, commercial, DOD, national security with our products, which also is good for when, when everything is flowing, is good for all the customers because you, you have greater quantities, it drives costs down for everybody, it makes everything more affordable. So I, I, I try not to stress about it anymore. I can't control it. Everyone's trying to do their best. This is how we deal with it. Trey? I agree. <laughs> Succinct. Uh, Catherine, is there? Yeah, I, I, I largely agree too. One thing I'll one, one thing I'll call out is uh, I was speaking to someone earlier who said, "Well, hopefully most of your companies are dual use." And yes, we have a number of dual use companies, and, and that might be you know one thing where it's like they can start focusing more on commercial versus DoD. But we also have hypersonics companies, and they don't have that option. And so I think like as you know as was said, like the best companies plan for it. They understand that this is the new normal. Uh, but we also have to understand that there are startups who have heard the call. Um, they've heard, okay, we need to build for the DOD. We are going to build solely as, as, for the DOD to be our customer. Um, and they do not have the luxury of, of sort of sitting back and waiting. And so I think we, we need to be mindful that there's a whole new generation of founders who, who really do believe this mission is important. Um, and they move faster than companies did 10 years ago because they have the capital, because they have the talent and the know-how to do it. Um, and so I think they expect that the DOD at some point will, will learn to move as fast as them. I want to add something to this as well. Um, I was having dinner with an unnamed combatant commander. I won't throw them under the, on, under the bus here. And I'll, I'll give you an exact two-sentence quote of what happened. He's, I said, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is? And he said, we really need dual-use technologies. We need the government to be involved in the commercial sector and get companies that are both commercial and government businesses involved in our acquisitions process. I said, okay, that's great. What do you need most? What is missing for your command? And he says, one word, weapons. <laughs> it, so there's like this weird thing going on where people are like, we don't want to own the risk and responsibility for the business being successful. We want dual use to you know, hedge that risk, as Eric said. And then you ask them what they want, and they say, we want things that blow up and go kinetic. It's like, OK, guy, you got sometimes it's not going to be dual use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and Eric uh, alluded to this, and, and Trey as well earlier, but um, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges that we've seen uh, in terms of requirements development is that Perhaps DOD or the services can be overly prescriptive and uh, <laughs> challenge uh, your ability to, to provide perhaps that 90, 95% solution. Um, Jason is <laughs> nodding knowingly here. Uh, is, is that speaking the same language or these conversations that are happening, these earlier communications, improving 
that situation at all, or is that still um, a, a barrier to innovation for you all? At, um, at Kratos, we have, we have many Kratos systems. One of them is affordability, is te a technology, but another one is better is the enemy of good enough. And in my 80 yard analogy, companies like us, we will build incredible products and demonstrate them. We've demonstrated some recently. They have demonstrated some awesome ones recently. They're, I'm making this up. They're 90, 95% of what anyone could ever dream of the requirement. Okay? And they're a fraction of the cost of that 100% requirement because that last 5 or 10% to get 100% is where four or five X times what it took to get the 90% comes from. I, we need a culture change. Well, let's get, let's get these products that are in the US, 99, 90 to 95% of the 100% requirement fielded, which by the way, are exponentially better than anything China has already. And then let's iterate off of them. And then if, 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 the, if we, if, uh, industry, Congress, the Pentagon, wants to go after the 100% requirement, then go run a solicitation for that. Go after it. Go for it. Let everybody bid. We like competition, but let's get something fielded that's better than anybody else has. It's low cost because it's 90 or 95% of the requirement. All right? It shows my friend here that there are winners. That's going to bring more money in. That money will be a force multiplier for the taxpayer and the Department of Defense. It will reinvigorate the industrial base. This is not difficult. That's, that's what needs to be done. I mean, if, I'd like to talk to the CEO who's in charge of this and say, you need to do this. Trey, did you want to weigh in on? I agree. <laughs> 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 You're saving us time. I like it. Um, Eric, I mean, just pulling on that thread, I mean, then what, if you, if you had your druthers, how, how would you, how would innovators writ large respond to this problem? How would you tackle the big threats with that 95% solution ahead of, say, a, a standard RF, RFI, RFP? Um, so back to my analogy, I, I think on this one, we're, we're 90 yards down the field, we're on the 10-yard line. The, pr the products in counter UAS, low-cost cruise missiles, low-cost drones, very low-cost hypersonic flyers, they exist. We're flying them. We industry, we're flying these all, all right? Understanding the realism of the situation, uh, if I was in charge, I would take half a percent of the defense budget a year, say $5 billion. <coughs> I, would, I would say, uh, Madam Secretary Hicks, here's $5 billion a year. Take that $5 billion and you are going to give production contracts to Palantir, to Andrel, to Kratos, to Shield, to Epirus, I can go on. Get the stuff fielded, and you're going to do it every year. Here's half a billion every year. Get it, get that stuff fielded, iterate off it, get it in the hands of the warfighter, and, and keep the FAR, keep all that, and let's see, how, let's see what happens after three years. I, I think it would be an incredible transformation without blowing up the system. If I could just Please. add, you know, we um, we've talked about the Small Business Innovative Research Program, the SBIR program. Prior to OSC, I led the Air Force's SBIR program, and we created this new process in that program called the Open Topic. And one of the reasons why is because the SBIR program traditionally was very requirements driven. And that budget <coughs> didn't actually require you to be requirements driven, right? So you could literally fund anything as long as there was a department potential need for it. Right, there wasn't a requirement to work on a certain specific system or even a certain technology. Um, and so we ran that as an experiment in 2018. And a number of companies, including Anderol, you know, have early, early contracts through that process and have gone on to be able to win successive phase three contracts. Now, we do have a gap. There is no, there's no corollary to SBIR on the production side. Right? There is no funding that's available just for production. Um, but it did work well enough on the, on the R&D side of the house, which is where SBIR is, uh, so that uh, you know, our, our, uh, our friends in the House and Senate, when they reauthorized the SBIR program, made a requirement that everybody have an open topic that took away requirements and allowed and lowered the barriers to entry for innovators 
Because at the end of the day, if you ask people, that, for the famous Henry Ford quote, right, if you ask people what they want, they're going to tell you a faster horse. And that's how we operate too, right? We know what we need. We think we need, we need that thing. And then we go ask for an incremental improvement to that thing, um, which is generally good for maintaining operational relevance. And you've got a force that's trained on the existing systems. But when you have ideas that are blooming outside of the DOD fence line, you need a way to funnel those in. And then we need a way to be able to actually accelerate into production. So as a corollary to the, the, the um, uh, you know, the desire to have some kind of uh, structure uh, funding available to accelerate production. We do have that on the R&D side of the house, and it has been successful as bring, bringing new entrants into the department. Is there any consideration of, of something like that on the, on the production side or any, any willingness? I mean, obviously, I know every, every billion is spoken for. Uh, perhaps a few times over. But. I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if the Department of Defense is the right, right <laughs> place to ask that question. I think the, uh, the key, you know, I will say on the OSC side of the house, we, we're pivoting away from spending to lending, right? This is, we're building a, a loan office, a loan program office, similar to the Department of Energy's loan program office, Export Import Bank, uh, Development Finance Corporation, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of loans we give out annually as a country because, uh, one, they affect you know, positive momentum and growth in specific areas that we care about, like energy, um, to include companies, you know, venture-backed companies like Tesla, who received loans from the DOE's loan program office. Uh, but also, uh, they're efficient to the taxpayer, right? At the end of the day, they actually, they don't increase spending. To do lending, you don't actually increase the budget. And we've seen and uh, that, that our, we don't expect massive growth in, 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 in budgets over the next few years. So we need to find more efficient ways but one of the great things that we're excited about within OSC is that they, these new tools allow us to directly partner with our capital markets, which are a competitive advantage in the United States. And you've seen the innovation base really leverage our capital markets to invest in these types of companies. And that has grown substantially. I mean, when I started doing some of this work with Afrox back in 2017, 2018, it was a very, you know, Catherine's point, it was a very small group of folks. Most of the investors I talked to would say, hey, I'm not going to touch defense with a 10-foot pole. Now that's completely changed, and that's great. And that venture is one part. You know, private equity is another part. Growth investment, banking. Right? These are all different ways that we can help mobilize things like production in our supply chain and hopefully reduce costs over time uh, and allow for more flexible uh, integration and deployment of capabilities because our supplier base is built in a way that can directly support these companies in a low risk kind of robust situation as opposed to where we are now, which is much more brittle than we'd like it to be. So Catherine, you said that, you know, Silicon Valley founders, funders and, and DOD are now all speaking the same language. Um, that being said, there, there still seems to be a disconnect um, between the incentive structure that is needed for uh, private capital and the timelines that uh, that the Pentagon <laughs> operates on. So, I mean, is there is there still is there a misunderstanding on the on the Pentagon side, or is it just that it's it's a very large ship to turn? I think it's really hard to change culture. You talk to any founder of any business, the hardest thing to do as you scale and become a massive org is to shift the culture and to remain lean, to remain hungry. And so we're working, you know, the DOD is, was, was, is very large. It is massive. And I think, you know, the, it, it's just going to take a lot of time to change the culture. I'm, by my nature, an optimist. I have to be because I'm an investor. So I think that the ch culture is going to change. I think there will be a number of success stories. And I am hopeful that those success stories lead to more innovation around the defense industrial base, that, that more companies enter the market. I think the thing that I'm... <coughs> pleasantly surprised by, I wouldn't have predicted, I'd love to hear whether Trey would have predicted this, is I, I can't overemphasize how enthusiastic, and I say Silicon Valley as a, a, not as a geography, but as an idea of company building. The, the, most in, like, the most incredible founders right now are entering this market saying, we want to build for America. I would have never expected that five years ago. It was, it was a handful of people like Trey, it was a handful of companies, but it was not an entire ecosystem of innovation. And we firmly believe that the next great you know, 15 years of innovation, the story of Silicon Valley, could be this hardware software selling to the Department of Defense. Like We have a once in a generation opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity to move back to the roots of what Silicon Valley was. And my biggest fear is that, to use again another great analogy, that we are on the 10 yard line 
everyone is speaking the same language. We finally have the talent that has come up through these great companies like SpaceX. We have the capital that's really patriotic, that's moved away from China and saying, we want to invest in America, we want to invest in hardware, and we're not going to get there. So I think that's the thing where, you know, I think we all can point the finger at why that is, and we'll all have different people to blame. But my biggest fear is that the next few years, we won't get, uh, you know, across, across the, to the touchdown, to use your analogy. Yeah, I think storytelling is so important um, to recruiting and retaining talent. Um, and as Catherine said, like, there's a tremendous amount of momentum right now in getting people who would otherwise you know, be going to optimize ads at Snap or Google or Facebook or whatever are now interested in doing something in national service. And um, I don't, I don't want to gas you up too much, but like Catherine has created language that has rallied troops and um, I think has been a brilliant storyteller that's, you know, created a, a movement that people are excited to get behind. And uh, we're super grateful to have people like Catherine that have been able to do that effectively. Um, and I think we haven't had that as much on the government side. It's been hard to like motivate and rally the troops behind this idea that this is something that we want to do. This is like a thing that we're excited about. It almost feels like um, people feel like they've been punished and they're you know, working their way out of purgatory or something. It's like not an exciting opportunity. Um, and so I think it would be great if we had like reciprocal amounts of excitement and momentum that are being driven from the government side about doing this work and rebooting that relationship that was so productive as recently as, you know, 30 years ago. It wasn't like ancient history. It was like very recently that there was a deep partnership. I realize we are the last thing standing between you all and lunch, but uh, wanted to open the floor to uh, any questions from the audience. We have gentlemen here. Wait for a microphone. <coughs> back a couple of rows. Uh, thanks, uh, Patrick Wilson from MediaTek. My question is about innovation inside of big incumbents, right? The, the challenge of getting uh, incumbent innovative companies, the really big companies in Silicon Valley, to embrace the same idea, right, about why you want to pursue a customer inside DOD or inside the IC. Um, that continues to be a real problem, right? Because they have a lot of the capital and a lot of the IP, I think, of the top 10 IP generators last year. Eight of them were semiconductor companies. How do we get those people who are not in startups, right? They're really innovative people inside really big companies to care about this enterprise. Do, do we mean the defense industrial base or do we, because like not NVIDIA. Defense industrial okay, right, got it. Yeah, um, wow. There's probably like multiple answers to this. The first is that, you know, if you're in China or Russia, um, the big companies don't have an option about whether or not they do work with the governments. Um, I don't think we should do that. Um, if you want to work at Google and Google decides that they don't want to uh, work with the federal stuff, I love you, Josh. I know you're, you're doing the Lord's work. Um, <laughs> Uh, then I don't think you should be forced to do that. Um, and so I think the expectation that the big tech companies have to do work for the government is probably not true to our democracy. Um, that said, uh, I think they would probably be more interested in doing business if it was more clear how to do so. Can I, can I maybe add just to that? I think, I think the correlate to that from my perspective is in, in 1957, when Sputnik crossed our skies, the Eisenhower administration tried to figure out ways to unlock talent. You know, Fairchild Semiconductors, spin out of Shockley, was born out of this brand new asset class called venture capital. It may have still been called adventure capital at the time, right? So they changed the way that we work directly with the capital markets to provide more opportunities to companies. And one of the things we're focused on with OSC is not only focused on the things that we buy, the pointy things that go boom, as, as Trey said, but also underlying technology base, right? Our semiconductor industrial base. I was talking with investors recently who were telling me how, how difficult it was. I was pointing to Trey as, as a class, not as a specific person. Uh, I'll keep them anonymous as well. How, how it was easier for them to invest in defense than it was into semiconductor companies these days. 
which when we look at things like CHIPS and Science Act, look at some of these other kind of broad national security opportunities that the government's trying to push out, it's a little shocking to me. And one of the things that we're focused on with OSC is trying to break free opportunities for maybe, maybe those large companies aren't going to pivot and directly support the Department of Defense, but providing opportunities for innovators, for entrepreneurs, for technologists to be able to go and start companies and actually bring some of this new technology to bear, increases competition in our critical technology supplier base in ways that we used to do when we were in, 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 in competitions in the past, and I think we can do again. Okay. We are unfortunately out of time. Uh, please thank our panelists for, I think, what's been a great conversation.